Okay, uh, hi everyone, welcome back to D22. Uh, this is our second showcase session with a number of presenters joining us uh, live, online, as well as uh, some participants here on stage. Before we begin this uh, second session, I'd like to invite up onto the stage, fresh out of quarantine, our head of school, Mr. Jason Hayter. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to D22 Emergence, the afternoon session of our program. And good afternoon to all of our faculty here in the auditorium and to those who are, uh, who are joining us in other places in Seoul or in Korea or around the world. I know we have a number of educators who are part of the learning today, and I just want to say a special welcome to all of you. Uh, as Dave mentioned, fresh out of quarantine, uh, not a better way to start back into the swing of things, but being able to share in the learning with colleagues and really take uh, what we do here as educators to that next step. For those of you who are maybe new to D22 or the Dwight Professional Development Day, uh, it was born by our, uh, out of our D21 conference last year, Learning, Making and Shaping, where our deans took the lead in bringing colleagues here in our school and in Seoul and South Korea and from around the world together to share in best practice and to learn from each other. Now with emergence, it's interesting, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the term, it's the process of coming into being or becoming prominent, right? So what better word than emergence for today's session where we're taking that learning and making it more prominent. We've heard from some wonderful speakers this morning uh, for, ranging from well-being uh, for our students, which is a you know, very important and prominent topic in today's world, considering all what we've had to deal with over the last two years, to making that... Um, prominent in learning of, of digital, the importance of digital media, uh, digital access, and how it can impact students' learning and their interaction with those around the world. As we want to make global learning, as is the, the, uh, the process of today, being involved with learners from around the world, more prominent as well. Understanding that in 2022, when we've had a lot of time on Zoom, we've had a lot of time interacting through social media, through uh, various uh, video conference calls, that it is prominent the importance of being able to learn and share from with each other. So just a great way to uh, return back to school today, uh, a wonderful way to spend a Monday uh, professional learning to, with each other and making the learning more prominent as we emerge into that next uh, phase of our, of our growth and our professional development. I just want to say thank you to Mr. Burke, Mr. Todd, Ms. Newman, uh, and their team for putting together a wonderful day of learning for all of our staff. Uh, I know we've only seen half the day so far, and we, there's already been a lot of takeaways for everybody. I'm sure the afternoon is just going to be uh, full of just as much more learning, and we look forward to what the afternoon brings. So thank you to the, the three of you, and your, I know you have a team that worked with you as well, uh, and for putting all the time and effort into making a wonderful day. Uh, welcome again to those who are joining us uh, from other parts around the world and we look forward to sharing in the learning and emerging to that next step this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, okay, so our first speaker for this uh, second session is uh, Tanya Latanzio. Now, Tanya is an author and renowned international educator, previously a teacher, coordinator, and manager with the IB. She is now Director of Innovative Global Education. Innovative Global Education has been established for over 10 years and in this time Tanya has worked as an educational consultant globally in both local and international educational settings. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to D22, Tanya Latanzio. Thank you everyone and uh, yeah, thank you David for that introduction and, and to Jason for um, your introduction for this whole idea really of sharing and learning. And we've got a really small amount of time in which I'm able to share with you today what I'm going to do. So I'm going to get into it because what we're going to talk about in the next 15 or so minutes is this idea of conceptual inquiry and what we mean by that. And obviously, usually this would be a lot longer. So I'm just going to share what I think are some of the main things that we need to consider when we're looking at an inquiry process. So what we 
we're really looking at is this idea of unpacking the conceptual inquiry process. And what do we mean by that? And what is that? So a lot of this work um, that I'm sharing with you is very much in the book, Taking the Complexity Out of Concepts, that Andrea Mueller and myself co-wrote. So if there was, this was something you wanted to follow up and visit, there's an opportunity to do that through that as well. But the first things I want to talk about is this idea of why concepts. And when we think about conceptual learning, it is that idea that it does promote more inquiry. It does promote more interdisciplinary links across the curriculum. It allows for transfer and application. It allows for sense-making and depth of learning. So for instance, if we're looking at a rainforest, we're limited by the idea that we're learning about a rainforest. But if we open that up to concepts of interdependence, system and balance, we might have some students who want to focus on the ecosystem of the ocean or others who want to look at it through the desert. So what we're doing now is we're offering choice for students to follow their own interests. But what we're also doing is we're saying, well, how did interdependence, how did the system work? What was the balance in the rainforest? Well, now that you've learned that and you've listened to someone else talk about the ocean, what was interdependence like there? What was the system like? How was it balanced? So we're able to transfer our learning, which gives us that greater depth of understanding. So we have more student choice, of course, and we have transfer and depth of learning when we move to a concept-driven curriculum. So I really wanted to start there because when I talk about a concept-based curriculum, and I talk about conceptual inquiry, the concepts are the language of the learning. And it's really important that we understand that inquiry is not a step-by-step -step process. It's an overlapping process that we revisit during the inquiry. We don't do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. What we're doing is based on our learners, we're back and forth and in and out as required. And I think that's really important that when we plan around a process, we're not being linear, that we're understanding, we're planning in response to our students. So this is the inquiry process that I like to use. And most importantly, in this process is that the student is at the center. So everything we do is in connection to that student. We're planning in response to their needs, not our own needs, not where we need the unit to completely go, but we're leaving space for that student, regardless of how old they are, that sits in the center. And the other thing as I keep talking about is this idea that the concepts are the language of the learning. And by that, I mean, we're connecting students to concepts. We're provoking their ideas around concepts through provocations that are perfectly chosen to represent what we're looking at. We're looking at inquiry as critical wondering. What do you understand? What are you interested in? We're investigating through those concepts, through that sense-making, through that understanding. In inquiry, students are active participants in their learning. They are not sitting back waiting for us to feed the learning to them. They are actively involved in it. We are, just, we are creating engagements that make them think. We're creating engagements that build on their understanding where they're having to make sense of their learning. We're reflecting on the concepts. What do you understand about them now? What do you still need to understand? We're representing our learning throughout this whole process. And of course, then we're transforming ourselves. How has this transformed us as learners? So when we think about the inquiry process, we're putting concepts at the forefront of that and the student in the center. So we might do some provocation 
we might get some questions, we might be doing some investigation. Then we might go, wait a minute, they're really interested in this. I'm gonna go back and do some more provocations. More questions arise. We're gonna do more investigation. And in the meantime, we've got this idea of reflection taking place throughout. So the most important thing to think about is that we're back and forth in this process with the students at the center. So what we're aiming to do is to make sure we're incorporating all of those elements for successful inquiry. But again, it's the student's knowledge, their experiences, their interests that determine how that takes place. Because again, we need participation by the learner for it to be inquiry-based. So I often talk about this idea of we plan in response to students, not for them. And the reason this is so important is because we need to leave that space for our learners in our planning. And it doesn't mean we can't have uh, some things planned where we want to head, but if we don't leave that space, we're not planning in response to the needs of our learners. What we're doing is we're planning where we think the learning should be going. We've got to take into consideration their prior knowledge, their current understanding. We've got to be formatively assessing them to find out where are they at in their learning? What do I need to do next? Where are they at in that conceptual understanding? Are they still at the idea where they're just identifying or are they starting to make connections now? And what we're doing is as we're doing that, as we're collecting that, we're embedding it into our planning. So leaving that space to make sure that we're planning in response, which is key to inquiry. So as I talked about earlier, we know when concepts are emphasized over concept, content, we have optimal opportunity for students to pursue their own inquiries. And what that also does, of course, is it provides motivation for further discoveries. So again, moving to concept-driven learning as opposed to teaching through topics allows that to happen, as I explained earlier. So we want to put that in the middle of our learning. We want that to be where we're heading always with our learners and where we're going with the learning. So I'm only going to look in a little bit of detail at one of the stages, um, which to me is probably the most important part. We want to provide an environment that really promotes student questions. And it doesn't matter what age students are, that idea that we value their questions. Um, when a student asks us a question, they are saying to us, this is something I don't understand, this is something I don't know, or this is something I'm interested in. It's probably some of the best formative assessment we can get. With younger children, it's in their theories. It's observing them, it's noticing where they're going. But that whole idea that we're encouraging this and we're finding a way to collect those wonderings to inform those student inquiries. So this being such a major part of the learning in an inquiry process. So we really want to be focused on the pedagogy of listening the pedagogy of observing. You know, there's that great quote by Alfie Cohn where he talks about the best teachers have bite marks on their tongue because they're trying to stop themselves from talking because they're valuing what's being said more. And we are documenting, we are recording these ideas. What are the students saying? What theories are we noticing that, that they have? What are they doing? Why does that student keep going back to that? What is it that's interesting them about that? 
What questions do they have? And really important, in particular as the students get older, what are those misconceptions? Because it's through that listening, it's through that observation that we know what to do next. So I always talk about this idea that what we're doing is we're provoking students in their learning. We're setting up our environment. We're putting things in front of them to get them having that discussion about the learning that's going to take place. And then we listen and we observe to see what comes out of that. So following the provocations, we're really listening and observing to understand our learners. So if we're looking at questioning, we really want to find a way to collect students' questions throughout the unit or throughout the learning. Now, this could be online. It could be a wonder wall up in your classroom. Um, what it is, it, it doesn't matter. But that idea being that we're collecting students' questions. But we're not only just collecting them. We're actually doing something with them. And this is where if you have a lot of questions, you can use a question technique formula where students are looking at the questions and making better questions or where they're grouping questions. Then you might have some real inquiry groups taking place. So what you do with them, it doesn't matter as long as something's done with them and they're incorporated into the learning. Um, I go into a lot of classes, uh, pre-COVID, when I could go into classes, and I would see these amazing wonder walls with these questions, these real in-depth questions that are powerful. And the teachers have said a few times, oh, we don't have time to do them. We don't have time to look at those questions, to incorporate them into the learning, then you, we really shouldn't be collecting them. Because all we're saying to students is we value your questions, but we don't really. And so if we're going to do this, they need to be embedded in our learning. And we need to make it clear to students how we're embedding them and what that looks like. And of course, the one thing we can do when students ask a question is say, well, how can you find out? So we want to put it back on them so they can find out for themselves as well. And again, realise they're participating in this learning too. It's not just us. So I'm just going to try and get back to my previous screen if I can. So this is from Diane Cashin um, from an article she wrote about sparking inquiry from children's emerging interests. And so the scene here, and which you can read in this article, was a, a, the students started to find worms. And of course, they're fascinated by the worms. There's questions coming out, there's theories, there's interest. But then what the team did was get together and think, well, what's the curriculum that's emerging from what we heard? What are those main ideas that we're noticing from our documenting the students' thoughts and ideas? And so you can see here on one side, we've got the curriculum. But then what they've done is they've planned in response to that. So if we're looking at worms, how tall they are, well, we're going to use sticks and tape measures to measure them. If we want to understand why worms are where they are, we're going to document and graph weather conditions. If we're looking at the characteristics of worms. We're going to set up an invitation with clay, with photos of worms for students to come and create. So what we're doing there is we're saying, well, this is the interest. These are the main ideas coming from the students. Therefore, this is what we do next. We're planning in response to students. And this one here, this one's about conflict. Um, so this was a couple of questions that came up. What other types of conflict are there? What if the conflict never gets solved? What happens? So again, what we need to be doing is thinking, how do we plan in response to that? What does that look like? So we were going to show videos and images of different conflicts for students to explore, to think about personal conflict, uh, conflicts around differing beliefs, political conflicts. 
And then we were going to introduce major moments of an ongoing conflict through a timeline and think about that and have students think in their own life, do they know any conflicts that have not been solved and the impact of this, in particular from a personal level. So again, we're planning in response, we're not planning for. So this is another one that we did with a group of students in Dresden um, International School. So we did some different provoking around this idea of expression. So we had ballet, hip hop, drawing, sculpture, singing, creativity, uh, singing and creating music with technology, mime and monologue, poetry and short expressive writing. So again, after the students were provoked, and again, the concept was expression. We allowed them to choose what they were interested in pursuing, and then we kept bringing them back to discuss this concept of expression. So the idea of expression was at the forefront, and again, that transfer and application, listening to what others have done and how it's impacted them. So we started with a provocation, then gave students choice based on what they were interested in pursuing further. So if students aren't involved in co-constructing the planning process, at the end of the day, it's really a teacher-driven unit of learning and it's not inquiry learning. And by co-constructing, the way I talk about it is that we're not sitting here and the students are in our planning sessions. What we're doing is the first conversation we have at our planning sessions is what's happened. What happened in your classes? What, what questions did you have? How did you go with your assessments? What did you notice about the students? Where are they at? What do we do? Therefore, what do we plan next as a way to plan in response to that? And in particular, to students' theories, to their questions, to their wonderings that come up and involve throughout that learning as well. And it should happen throughout the entire learning. So that was the main thing that I really wanted to focus on today is looking at this whole idea of students' critical wondering and how we plan in response to students not for them. I'm just going to stop my share. And I know we've just got, oh, we've only got a couple of minutes, but I didn't know if anyone had any questions that they wanted to ask before we finish up. Uh, Tanya, I'd like to say... Or I don't know if we can ask questions, actually. <laughs> of course. Yes, we do. Plenty of questions. Uh, Tanya, I'd just like to say thank you very much. And coming through from today, there's themes coming from each of our speakers which you've just built further upon, that of flexibility and how we respond to students and their interests within the classroom, and particularly offering them a choice and encouraging, uh, utilising that choice to further engage our students. And really, as you have put it, it is really planning in response to what the students bring forward rather than for them. And so I really am getting that key thing, flexibility. Thank you. No, you're welcome. My pleasure. Does anyone else have a question out there that they'd like to ask? Because Tanya, we're, we're an IB school, so we're, we're right with you on this. We, uh, you know, we're inquiry driven and, uh, and conceptual, but we continue to have to push ourselves and um, you've shared some more reading for us, I think, that will be very useful that we can take away from the session today too. So thank you for that. Pleasure. All right. Well, uh, now, Tanya, we really thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. It's a fantastic presentation. Uh, but uh, time has caught up with us. So, ladies and gentlemen, please thank Tanya Latanzio. Thank you, everyone. And, yeah, that's one thing. There's never enough time. Thank you. Okay. Our, our next presenter, you saw him for a split second there on, on screen, mm -hmm. uh, will be joining us in a moment. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Gihan Jayawira. Dr. G, as he is known, is a general practitioner based in Melbourne, Australia, and a social entrepreneur with a passion for solving problems that really annoy him. His ultimate vision is to learn how to build profitable and self-sustaining social businesses that Recording solve, in progress. That solve uh, big social problems, including Zoom problems, thereby impacting the lives of millions. It's our great pleasure to welcome to D22, Dr. Gihan Jayawira. Thank you so much, David. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I can't wait to get this rolling. 
as as you said, uh, most of my patients pretty much call me Dr. G now. And my passion alongside my general practice is to work with busy people who are doing meaningful work and make help them figure out a way that they can do that meaningful work and not be at the expense of their health and happiness. So that's what brought me to working closely with educators. So I'm super, super excited. And today, we were, I mean, the initial thought was that we were going to do a bit of a keynote, but I thought it might be more engaging, more interesting to try something a little bit different and do a bit of a live, unscripted troubleshooting um, with our friend Michael Karma, who's kind enough to volunteer. Michael, are you there? Yes, hello. Hi, Gihan. How are you? Ah, uh, look, I'm living the dream. I'm living the dream. Oh, that's and, good. Uh, thank good you for, for you. volunteering. Yeah, people there in person, I think he deserves a, a bit of an applause. <laughs> um, so, Michael, do you want to describe, I guess, the, the well-being problem or a specific well-being problem that you're facing and that you think a lot of your peers would be facing as well? Um, I think, as a collective, it's planning and looking ahead, putting things together, which is so often followed by disappointment after that, because things are pulled back because of numbers and because of COVID and things like that. And I think there's a certain amount of anxiety that that surrounds that, and, and, and it's unavoidable, I think, at times. If I give an example, even just today, yeah, if I give an example just today, and from my own perspective, I had to take a rapid test because of various reasons. And before I took that test, I was walking upstairs, and in my head I'm thinking, all right, okay, if it comes back positive, right. Okay, so I need to make sure that the inter-school inter debating on Saturday, someone's going to follow, someone's gonna have to take over that. What if I can't find anyone? All right, the kids are going to miss out. Okay, so I've got to speak to a student on Thursday. Look, I won't be able to do that. That's all right. I can maybe do that over email. These sorts of things, like in that small amount of time, I had to deal with that anxiety. And like, I wasn't manic or anything like that, but there were considerations I had to think. And, and then I thought, oh, well, I'm going out to dinner with friends tonight. That won't be happening. I'm supposed to be with friends tomorrow. That won't be happening either. So there's all these things that this, followed by this crashing disappointment. And I think that's what all of us feel at times, and especially for our students as well. Camps are cancelled. And all these things that just keep presenting disappointment. So thank you for sharing that. So in summary, I would see that is sort of, I guess, addressing the uncertainty. Mm and the constant flow of unmet expectations. Yes. Uh, it, it seems like the, the goalposts seem to constantly be shifting, which is, mm. which is really challenging. Which is um, a problem around the world. I mean, this isn't a, a Dwight problem or a, you know, an upper school problem or a lower school problem. It's obviously a global problem, but I think from the day-to-day situations that, that, that aren't talked about, I think, and that's no one's fault, but yeah. that day-to-day -day thing <clears throat> of disappointment, that's not happening, that's not happening. All the effort that goes into, that's now withdrawn. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I might, what I might do, Michael, I'll share a, a model and okay. we'll try to troubleshoot this problem specifically through the lens of this model, if that's okay. okay? Sounds good. Um, so let's start with um, the happiness bucket. I think most most educators would have had some some variation of this. Um, when the bucket is empty, we get burnt out. And when the bucket is full, we're on fire, which uh, in Australia is a good thing. I'm not sure. <laughs> There's a global audience, but being on fire is generally a good thing in Australia. So. Let's talk about filling the bucket. This is where generally the conversation exists. Um, and we fill our bucket with resources. Mm -hmm. And they can be internal resources. And this is generally sort of the classic self-care stuff that we, we do, you know, uh, sleep, uh, exercise, exercise, good what, food, right food yep. maybe meditation. And then we have external resources so people or 
other resources that fill our bucket. So that might be our family, our friends, mm-hmm. our colleagues, um, external external bodies like EduSpark, or trainers, that sort of stuff. And then, of course, this bucket, this happiness bucket, uh, has holes in the bottom. Everyone's happiness bucket does. And these holes are the demands. And again, these demands can be internal and external. And in terms of filling our bucket and keeping it full or overflowing, the game we want to try to play at a a very holistic point of view is to try to increase our resources and decrease our demands. Mm -hmm. The classic approach to well-being is to fill the bucket. So to add stuff, Uh, you know, I really should exercise more or I should meditate more or I should X, Y, Z, right? I think for busy people, it's more efficient instead of focusing on up here to focus on sealing the holes in the bottom. So this concept of dealing, of addressing the uncertainty, addressing the unmet expectations is a combination of internal and external demands. Um, mm-hmm. So, first, do, firstly, do you have any questions, Michael, or anyone? No, no. Um, does anybody have a question? No, no. Please keep going. Awesome, awesome. So let's delve a little bit more into the internal expectations. So the internal expectations are like uh, the, the standards that we set ourselves, um, <clears throat> the expectations that we set for ourselves, and the external demands are other people, other resources. Mm-hmm. Um, other stakeholders, you know, your colleagues, parents, the students themselves, the department, X, Y, Z, right? So if we look at the internal demands, generally when we're dealing with uncertainty and we're not, it's causing a lot of discomfort, often it's a slight malalignment with our relationship with control. So, If we look at this as everything that happens in our life. Can you say control along with the the idea of expectations as well? Um, I will get to that. I will get to that. That's a great question. Um, So if you look at this big square as everything that happens in our life, this small square, and I use the word small loosely, um, is what we can control. And everything outside of that is what we can't control. So, Michael, from a big picture view, what can you control as an individual? Well, me. Yes, exactly. Well, I'd like to think I can control myself. (laughs) That's look. That's a work in progress for all of us. So, not quite sure what you're laughing at. So, what we say, what we do, and with practice, what we think. That's a yeah, little bit more exactly, nuanced, but, exactly. Um, for the time being, um, sort of trust me on that. I know it's a dangerous thing to say, but trust me on that. Um, therefore, everything else outside of that, by definition, is what we can't control. So these are events such as COVID. This is other people, including... Um, your students, including your colleagues. And along with the events, I guess, you know, whether whether your rat test comes back positive or not, I mean, it's actually outside our control. The the tension or the uncertainty leading to the disappointment and the expectations that come with that are when people are living here, at least at a subconscious level, but they think they're here. So it causes this this tension because you're living in a, at least in that moment, in a can't control part of life, but you sort of at least at a subconscious level think you can. And it causes this tension. And often these expectations that are unmet, they have always been outside our direct control. We could influence them perhaps, but we can't 
necessarily directly control them. But like you right, rightfully said, you can control yourself. Hmm. Um, any questions on that before I go on? No, not from me. No, I think keep going. Awesome. So then the next layer is you still need an answer for, for all this, all this, the, the chaos of, of life at the moment. And a simple question, but powerful question to ask is what, I mean, the first question is, sorry, can or can't? This is a really useful question to ask in a moment of discomfort because it allows you to decide whether it's something you can or control, can't um, control. So if it's a can control, beautiful, don't worry. If it's can't, then also in theory at least, don't worry. Once you figure out whether it's can or can't, let's say it's a can, this is, the, this is where you can get really resource, resourceful, is you can ask yourself, what can I do? Sorry, this is, I'm a doctor, right? Not a teacher, so my writing sucks. I'll, I'll apologize now. <laughs> what can I do um, to make things better, to make the situation better? Or what can I think? to make the situation better. And if you can come up with as many possible points, you know, I would say at least, at least five things. And then if you get to five, do another five. If you get to five, it just, it helps to try to exhaust your options and get more and more creative. This is a great analogy I use. Um, my sister-in-law, her, her boss, who's a CEO of a not-for-profit, He's made the whole wall in his office a whiteboard. And the reason is he thinks that if the whiteboard's too small and the answer's at the corner of the whiteboard, you might not get there. So if you keep asking what else, what else, what else, it gives you more of an opportunity to get to the corner of the whiteboard. And the more you practice this in yourself and maybe... Also, it would be maybe something cool to teach the students as well. Yeah, I was just thinking that, yeah. This, this grows. What Your circle of influence grows. And it is an empowering and I would say addictive, <laughs> addictive experience because you feel like you, you can, you know, you have this sort of really high sense of I can, I can still do something about this. So even when there's so much against, there's still that element of, something I can do rather than looking at the cards Absolutely. and the Not negative. Not just one thing, a lot of things yeah. and trying to get to the corner of the whiteboard. So let's say the rat test was positive. Okay, what are the options? Can, who, who are the, um, who, who can I tell, you know, how, how can I mm. make this work? How can I still make sure that this, ex this, is, this is how you can change your thinking? Asking good questions for yourself. So let's say I'm not there. How can I make the student's experience the same or even better. Okay. And the answers to these questions may lead to a dead end. Or you might get to the corner of the whiteboard and say, like, wow, this is actually better than what I was going to do. But it allows you to really act within what you can control. Okay. And then the next layer is if it's something you can't control, you ask the exact same question. What can I do or think? The only difference is instead of you decipher between the difference between what can I do or think to control this and you make it what can I do or think to influence this. Because that shows an understanding that you, act, you can't directly control it. And if you think you can and things are your expectations and that in itself is an expectation, yes. if that's not met, then that can lead to disappointment in itself. So again, you ask the same question and you, are, and you try to get to the corner of the whiteboard and it's empowering to say the least the, the creativity, the innovation that can come from adversity in these types of situations and even when they're not. Um, does anything come to mind, Michael? Any thoughts or anyone I'll, else? That's I'll, I'll get the, back to that. I did have a chat. thought about something but it's, it's left my mind now. Keep going, I did have a thought. That's okay. Um, so that's your internal demand. So that's starting to seal some of the holes um, at the bottom of all of our buckets. The next thing is if we look at the external demands. 
So often these external demands are people, like I said, like parents, teachers, colleagues, um, students, the department, family, friends, and commitments, deadlines. And they all vie for our time, money, and our energy. Mm. And sometimes, instead of adding something, like, you know, I'm not feeling, I'm starting to get um, burnt out, let's say, I'm starting to really, you know, itch, you know, get close to that line. Instead of thinking, oh, you know, maybe I should exercise more or meditate more, which is great advice. And if you can do it, you should. I would look at it at how can I seal the holes in the bottom? And particularly with the external demands, a great question, a great frame to look at is what can I let go? Or what can I eliminate? That is a good and then suddenly question. the well-being discussion turns into a productivity discussion. That could be quite confronting, though. What can I let go? Because again, there's a bit of it, there's a, that, that's a control issue for some, I think. That is that's an interesting. It's interesting you say that. So it's for me. I think I'm going through this right now, actually. And what's worked is adopting a level of curiosity and not making things final. So instead of thinking, I'm, I'm going to let this go forever, even if you don't say that out loud, it feels like that in the moment, right? I would say, well, let's say, you know, I have all these commitments, all these people, blah, 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 blah. What can I let go? And it's like an experiment. I'm going to try it for a week. You know, you try it for a week or two weeks after the two weeks, is everything still okay? Or is this, is this a big problem? I, I mm -hmm. probably shouldn't let that go. Often you find things not, are not as important as they seem in the moment. And the more you let go, the more you have of the time and energy and this bucket can start filling on its own. And then, of yeah. course, if you have more time, you can do whatever you want with it. That could be yeah. Watching Netflix, that could be jumping on Edgy Spark, that could be meditation, whatever it is. But yeah. it gives some agency back because this time is so elusive. And what can happen is this external demand of time suddenly becomes an external resource. Thanks, Gihan. I'm just going to, I think David Burt's going to jump back on in case there's any questions. Is there time? Um. I was there is we've got one more minute, but um, I think just on that concept of um, letting go, I think that's probably one of the things that as educators, when it comes to things for our students, we tend to have trouble with that. That sometimes it's okay to let things go because it will uh, it will it will benefit our students in the long run if we're performing at our best. There's a there's another uh, just on the chat channel here. Um, a note from Andrew Mowat, um, Edgespark team, and uh, he's saying, you know, if this is not new for you, um, it's it's a life-changing reminder. But if it's new for you, then it could be life-changing. So, um, thanks, Dr. G. My good friend Andrew. He's a he's a beautiful human being. Thanks, thank you, Andrew, for for that comment. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're right out of time. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a big thank you to Dr. Gihan Jayawira. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. G. And just before we move along, there's a really good comment. There's quite a few comments rolling in on the YouTube link. Um, I like this from Jonathan Pratt. He says, uh, these days, the only certainty is uncertainty. I would like to see that turned into a meme. Perhaps, Leachy, you could arrange that and we could have... Jonathan Pratt, 2022, that could become very well known. Um, all right, moving right along. The, uh, our next uh, presentation, as we know, today is a staff development day, so only staff are on site, uh, but this next segment was recorded last week with a group of student leaders here at Dwight. Richard Todd caught up with them to talk about student agency at Dwight School Seoul. Student leaders are a vital part of any good school, as they help to maintain student focus and remind everyone why we are here. 
Rina, would you like to tell us about the role of the Student Council? To briefly talk about StuCo, we are basically the bridge between staff and students. Our ultimate aim is to increase school spirit through events and enhance school experience for students through seeking their voice and making changes accordingly. You must have faced a number of challenges over the year due to COVID-19. How have you overcome those challenges, Claire? I think due to COVID protocols, there were a lot of limitations in terms of events or things that we do. But, and there was a lot of cancellation of major events like homecoming. However, we tried to find our way around the protocols and also find ways to interact with each other and make the school spirit happen. You took on a very important public role. How has your leadership developed over the year? Um, this year was my first time being a president of a student council. And not only that, it was our members' first time in being in student council. So it was very challenging at first, but what I learned from it was that is to create an affable atmosphere. I really tried to do this because Duco's role is to organize events where students have fun. And we can't do that when our meetings are rigid or dull. So we do meet frequently, twice a week, but our meetings are often full of laughters, jokes. We throw around the most ridiculous ideas. But sometimes you go like, oh, wait, if you just tweak that a bit, that actually can be a great idea for students. Students can actually have fun. And so this positive, somewhat goofy atmosphere allows the creativity to really flourish as well as and the, all the members seem less uncomfortable to share their own opinions just out of the fear that they'll get rejected. And honestly, after that, it's all been the members. Really, we have formed this tight bond, even, that, even after school, we have this group chat and we do our roles that were delegated to us and then we share it through that group chat and then I can see everyone everyone really giving active feedbacks and encouragements with each other. And I personally have really gained a lot from our um, members' words of encouragement. Final question is, what advice would you give to other student leaders who may be, or potential leaders who may be wishing to take on leadership responsibilities? I think the main thing is that don't be caught up in fear and have this growth mindset because usually you grow more from failure rather than success. And don't be afraid of failure as well because it's a necessary thing and it's going to get you to a better place if you grow from that failure. And an advice that I would give to all the leaders is to never try to take everything just by yourself. And this comes from experience because in the beginning of the year, I was hesitant to tell my members what to do because I felt that it was demanding. So I would try to do them all by myself, but as a high school junior, I have a lot of things going on, including academics and extracurriculars. So I was burdened to try um, balancing everything, and I also felt like the quality could have been better. So I had a lot of talk with the teachers and as well as seniors. And I started delegating roles. And the members did an extraordinary job. They came up with creative ideas that I couldn't have ever th thought of and at such a timely manner. So believe in your members is an advice that I will give because they have proven themselves as skillful from the election process. So they are reliable. Rina and Claire, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Next, I'd like to welcome Fassi Sheikh and Ian Song from our Dwight School Soul Entrepreneurship Club. Our club is a place for students interested in entrepreneurship and business to meet like-minded people and to work on projects together while gaining new skills and knowledge. Could you give us what it means to you? Yeah, definitely. So the word entrepreneur itself, just by the dictionary definition, means someone who creates a business from scratch. Um, but when we were naming our club, we were actually aiming for a slightly different connotation that comes with the word entrepreneur. The connotation we were aiming for specifically was the ability to create something from scratch, 
some people refer to this as going from zero to one. And that basically means that you are building something from nothing. We're not building on previous infrastructure or projects. And that's really the spirit that our club embraces. So to give a bit of summary, our club grew to 20 some members in just six months. Uh, the reason for this was that uh, we realized there was a lack of business related activities for students. and. Uh, and this comes from personal experience of not being able to find teammates or partners to join competitions with. So the club um, executives found this problem and targeted the solution by proposing the club. Uh, furthermore, for what we do in the club to sustain it, uh, we implemented a agile team structure in where, uh, which kept the folks of the club very narrow and straight focused and which allowed um, students to work in small groups and had specific tasks which allowed for work to be done faster and but also give time for improvement. Um, our main objective for the club was for it to be member-based and flexible, so therefore students have the opportunity to um, do whatever they want. Uh, they can propose new ideas or do new projects or join competitions while receiving help from the club executives. And lastly, for our structure of the club, we have two departments. Uh, one is the business competition department, and the second is the entrepreneurial project department, uh, which is just like a firm in real life. So in this short space of time that the club has existed, we have had significant progress. Uh, a few months ago, a team of uh, eight students participated in our very first competition called the Korea Business Competition. After a few rounds with a bit of perseverance and confidence, the team placed second out of 22 teams and around 130, uh, 130 uh, participants. Furthermore, the club also, the entrepreneurial department of the club also hosted a ramen project uh, for upper school students. Essentially, the idea was to sell ramen to students a while, and it, it was a, as a f fundraiser, and w from the money that they got from, uh, ramen, uh, from the ramen project, they donated to a char charity of their choice, uh, raising social benefits in, in the doing so. Okay, thank you. And Ian, next question is for you. So you established the Entrepreneurship Club during the COVID pandemic. Can you tell us some of the challenges you faced by establishing the club during this time? Well, obviously, the COVID pandemic has been challenging for everyone, not just us. Um, one of the main solutions that really anybody implemented during this time was simply the use of online technologies such as Zoom and Google Meets. And we also embraced that technology, too. And it was actually extremely beneficial to us because one of the core components that our club runs on is co clear communication between members and always checking on each other to make sure everyone is doing what they want and uh, making progress. And the ability to communicate online, even when we're not facing each other in person, was extremely helpful because we could you know, talk to each other when we weren't together in the same area. And the communication we were able to build based on that expanded a lot. Thank you. And the final question is, what advice would you give to anybody in our audience who is thinking of establishing a club? Well, personally, I'd give two pieces of advice. Of advice. Um, the first piece of advice I'd give would be to go get some experience yourself. By that, I would mean try joining, uh, it, it doesn't even have to be an entrepreneurship club, but just join another organization or a group of people who are trying to build something from scratch, see how they uh, communicate with each other, see how they execute ideas. And once you have some of that experience, then I would recommend you to go back to your local community and then help, help, well, help other students by spreading the experiences you learned, uh, you gained. I think that's the most natural process of creating a club and that's what we did. The second piece of advice I'd personally give would be to find a really good mentor. Um, for us, our uh, mentor and advisor is Mr. Webb. He's been a tremendous help to establishing this club and also making sure all the students in our club can fully reach their potential in entrepreneurship and business. Thank you. And now for our third group of students from Dwight School Souls Robotics Club. I'd like to welcome Michelle Yi and Yongju Choi. Welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction. So, can you share with us a little about the history of the Robotics Club and how it has been established? Yeah, so I established the Robotics Club when I was in ninth grade. So that's about four years ago. So our club has quite a long history at Dwight. And I think it was one of, I think it is, you know, one of the longest running um, clubs that are here currently um, in our school. 
And so, you know, we began as like a mere gathering of students who just wanted to try robotics out. And so it was just around um, six students, you know, my friends, and we were just uh, gathering after school to uh, learn robotics and try to enter some competitions. Um, and, you know, we really found ourselves being, you know, engrossed in this activity. And so we would come after school almost every after school and stay until like 7 p.m., you know, as long as, you know, we didn't get kicked out. <laughs> and so, you know, we would participate in competitions. And, um, you know, by enjoying this process, I think we were able to have great results. And so um, that first year, we were able to actually win the national championships in Korea. And, you know, through that process, we learned a lot of things like teamwork and uh, leadership. And we were also able to persuade the school to, um, you know, support us even more because now we have uh, shown that we're really dedicated to this activity. And so through that, um, we were able to get our own room and also financial support for different robotics equipment because robotics is quite an expensive um, sport compared to, like, basketball. And so, you know, we've been continuing this for the past four years, and we've been uh, putting, up, putting in as much dedication every year. And so the results are, you know, has been very consistent. We've been winning uh, the national championship almost every year and also performing well in the world championships. Um, it was kind of hard to get new members every year. And so, you know, we would advertise through emails, posters, and still we would have an issue. But, you know, I think now that so one solution we were able to find was to, uh, you know, turn robotics into an official sport in our school rather than like, uh, you know, gathering, like a personal gathering of students that we started with. So we were able to do that by um, like persuading uh, Mr. Warner and uh, our, our leaders in our school to help uh, advocate for us in the kayak. And so we were able to make robotics actually the first uh, STEM-related sport in kayak. And after that, I think um, there, were, there was a lot more interest in joining the robotics team. And you know, we were able to solve that issue of interest um, and continued participation. Uh, the second issue that I faced when you know, first establishing the club was getting support uh, from the school. And I've, I've mentioned that already, that by showing our dedication, I think the school is more willing to uh, invest uh, and support us, although they're, they're always willing to help out students that are you know, proactively you know, taking leadership and pursuing their passion. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Michelle, you are one of those new members who has joined uh, Robotics Club this year. So fr from joining, what have you learned this year? So along with like, helping me learn how to balance my time across my responsibilities, I think that a really good way in which robotics has helped me as an IB learner is that it's been a good source of motivation. So as Youngju mentioned, we've seen, our teams have seen some pretty good success. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the amount of like, effort, time, and dedication we show to the activity. So in that way, it's kind of shown me that if you put the effort into something, rewards will follow. And um, with the IB being kind of, uh, such a rigorous program, I think that that type of motivation is really good to have. So yeah. Okay, thank you. And finally, is there anything that you would like to say to anybody out there who is thinking of joining or establishing a robotics club? So for anyone who wants to join the robotics club, as Michelle said, um, it's a very valuable experience where you can not only learn the technical skills that will um, you know, put you at a competitive advantage, I guess, when you go to university. Um, it gives you like the life skills that you need, like collaboration and communication that will help you in your life. And so um, think of robotics as like a place where you can learn not just the technical, but just all these different kinds of skills. And um, you know, I definitely encourage you to participate in robotics uh, if you have the chance. And for whoever wants to establish a robotics club you know, in their own school, I'd recommend that you start out with a group of students that are genuinely interested in doing robotics because it does require a lot of time and effort in the beginning. And you know, try and persuade or get the school to support you um, you know, financially and in terms of like mentorship, get a really like passionate mentor that will help you in the process. And I think you'll be good. Thank you. And I'd like to say thank you very much to all of our student leaders who have joined us here today. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to what they've had to say. 
Are we back? We are back. We're back live. Okay, thank you very much. And how about a big round of applause for our uh, student leaders? Some great things happening here, and it's great to see so much student agency in action here at Dwight School Seoul. Now, our next uh, presenter is Tonya Gilchrist. She's an international learning strategist who specialises in helping schools around the world amplify inquiry and honour. Uh, sorry, inqu inquiry and honour agency for deep learning and transfer across languages, literacies and disciplines. From Reader's Writer's Workshop to Regio to UDL to IB, Tonya works with schools to tailor professional learning just for their specific uh, contexts and their unique needs. Previously, she enjoyed many years as an educator, instructional coach and curriculum specialist. So it is our great pleasure to welcome to D22, Tonya Gilchrist. Thanks for having me, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. Um, super excited to share some ideas. I know the time is going to fly, so uh, we'll dive right in. But we're really going to zoom in on one of my favorite topics. Um, as was mentioned so wonderfully in the introduction, I work on a lot of different things with schools around the world, um, really catering to what are your needs. And we know every school is different, so there's lots of different needs. But one big topic that comes up again and again is how do we bring together workshop with inquiry-based approaches. How do we bring together workshop and the IB for many schools? Um, so we'll be zooming in on some ways that they go together in the short time that we have, and then uh, hopefully some time for questions too. So as I share a few ideas, I'd love for you to be thinking, what are some questions that are on your mind? And I think a really important starting place is just um, kind of what, what stance, what mindset we take. So I'm hoping that we can all take this kind of mindset we see here with John from John Spencer. He says, instead of thinking outside the box, innovation often involves thinking differently about the box. So that's often a starting place is rather than thinking, you know, we have a workshop in this box over here and, and PYP or MYPIB in this box over here. What if instead it's same box? What if they're really about the same pursuits? and they can be stronger together. Maybe they amplify each other. And that's really the stance um, that we're gonna take. And so with that in mind, it can be helpful to think differently about the box too by kind of defining our terms. What are these things and what are they not? Because as you've likely experienced yourselves, there's, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions out there. So we could start with a few things that are really key to, to our work as IB educators. And one would definitely be inquiry. I often like to think of it in this way. Inquiry is not a fill in the blank pursuit, right? I think sometimes there's a misconception out there that inquiry is a very lockstep march through one specific process, but inquiry can look many different ways um, depending on your context and in your classroom. So play, experimentation, PBL um, are all, all have a place in inquiry-based learning. And so does explicit teaching. Explicit teaching has a place too. And so we're gonna circle back to that. Sometimes there's a misconception that explicit teaching doesn't have a place in inquiry, but of course it does. It's just more how and when and why, because inquiry-based learning is really about authenticity. Um, we believe in inquiry-based learning, not only because it's fun, it should be fun, learning should be fun, but it's so much more than that. It's really sound pedagogy. Um, it's authentic and purposeful to how we naturally learn. So we're going to take an inquiry-based approach because that's what learners do. Um, if you think about yourself and something new you've wanted to learn, you likely inquired. Maybe you looked up YouTube videos, researched articles, talked to friends who were skilled um, in what you were learning about, and then you went from there. Um, and then you naturally probably went through the interplay of asking and doing and reflecting. So again, it's not a lockstep march. It's more of this interplay of those inquiry pieces that we live out. Um, and so we want to create spaces, learning opportunities, learning spaces where students get to live that interplay on the regular. Uh, it's important that they live out inquiry to build that capacity as critical thinkers, as figuring out kind of people. And then agency is at the core as well. So inquiry is a huge part of our work and so is agency. And within the IB, we'll often hear this kind of definition, voice choice ownership. And that's really what agency is about. Um, 
And, and choice is often the driver, it's often the starting place, but we don't want to stop there. So too often, if we're not careful, agency could become just kind of a tick box on a checklist. Like I gave some options in class today, so agency done. And it's like, of course not, of course not. It's so much more than that. Ownership um, is a big, big piece. And that's really what it's all leading towards is to students having ownership in their learning lives and in their lives in general. Because what agency is really about is living out like self-regulation, decision-making. Um, there's this great graphic from a wonderful book, The Power of Agency, and I really appreciate how it, how it lays out a way to think about agency in our classrooms and in our lives. So it's moving up to this upper quadrant, sound judgment and confident action. That's what it means to really live agency. And so we need to create spaces where students are making their own decisions. You know, how do you get better at making decisions? By making lots of decisions. And then seeing like what doesn't work and what does, right? The more I can figure that out and learn from that, the more I grow in my confident action, the more I grow in my sound judgment. Because notice I don't wanna be down here either. And you might see this with some students, you might've lived this in your own life yourself where we're actually overconfident um, and our judgment isn't matching our action. We want to help students not be indecisive or stuck, but also not overconfident, really living agency. So that means they recover and learn from those mistakes so that they really develop that confidence, resilience. With that comes self-efficacy, self-regulation. With living this comes so many of the ATL, our approaches to learning, profile attributes. We want students living it, and that means getting lots of time to practice it. And that's really what workshop is about. So this is where, again, same box, not different pursuits, same box. Because workshop is not, just like inquiry is not a mindless march, neither is workshop. Workshop is not a specific program. So it's not this little robot here, even though I think he's super cute. Um, that's not workshop. It's not us just following someone else's script or using a specific program. There are many resources out there, and some of your schools might have those resources, wonderful resources um, from Teachers College, maybe from Jennifer Saravallo, from Kylene Beers, from others that are just fantastic. But any book or tool that you utilize is meant to be a resource. It's not one specific program, and there are many to choose from, not just one specific uh, set of books. It's also not the whole of our instruction. So if you use a workshop approach in reading, for example, you would use Reader's Workshop, but it wouldn't be the only thing you do with reading. Um, you'd also have read aloud within your context. You'd likely also have times of shared reading. Um, it wouldn't be the only, only way you do reading. It's just a big part of it, but not the whole. And it's also not language or discipline specific. So if you're here today and you're a music teacher, you can for sure use the workshop framework and approach in, in your classroom. There are many schools using what, what they call studio workshop for art, music, and more. Um, math workshop, for example, I'm working with a lot of schools where we're taking a, a workshop approach to math. So it's not discipline specific. Also, many schools are taking this approach in other languages that live in their school. It's not specific to just one language, like English, for example, not language or discipline specific. That's what workshop is not, because what it is, is it's a philosophy, it's a framework. You know, again, same box, inquiry is a spirit. Inquiry is not the thing that we do from 1 to 2 p.m. every day during this block of time. We might have a block of time to dive into a unit of inquiry, for example, but inquiry lives throughout all that we do. Inquiry is a spirit and a stance. In a lot of ways, workshop is a spirit and a stance as well. It's this philosophy. Um, and in order to live out this philosophy that's based on decades of research, really going back to the late 1960s, um, to live that out, we have a framework in mind, a framework that's inquiry and agency rich, a framework that's all about responsive teaching and personalized learning. So we're going to take a few minutes together to think about that frame 
And just again, I hope we're thinking like, how do how does inquiry and agency live here? How might this enhance all of our uh, beliefs and our philosophy in the IB? So if you think about a chunk of time you have with students, it could be any discipline, any language, you have a chunk of time to work with them. A workshop philosophy says, how am I going to spend my minutes in ways that really matter? Because, you know, as educators, I often think time is our currency and we never have enough of it. <laughs> we even use that phrase in English of how will I spend my minutes, right? It's this currency. We only have a certain amount. We want to be really mindful of how we do spend it, really intentional. And that at its heart is what workshop is about. So if you see this rectangle and you have this block of time with your students, with a workshop approach, we would bookend this time with community. Um, community matters. Community is a big part of a workshop approach. We're a community of learners. We're all learners. We're all teachers. We're inquiring together. So we want to ensure we have some community time. And that would be your mini lesson and your share. The mini lesson would likely be about 10 minutes. We're going to have likely one big question we're exploring with like one clear strategy or idea that you're sharing with students. Not 17 different things in one lesson, one clear thing. So we're really about clarity and uh, kind of quality in this mini lesson. And then we're gonna send kids off to live it. Because again, how do you get better at living out agency by living it? How do you get better at any thinking skill, any skill, playing piano, playing soccer, reading, writing, you need to live it. So that's what workshop is about, is the bulk of our time, this big chunk of time in the middle is for students, what I like to call living the work, right? So if it's writer's workshop, they're writing, writing, writing. Reader's workshop, reading, reading, reading. Math workshop, problem solving, problem solving. If it's what some schools sometimes call researcher's workshop, like maybe you're diving into some science and social studies types of topics, researching, researching, researching. Too often in our classrooms, kids are talked to about writing or about reading, but they don't get to actually do it. Or they're talked to about ways to problem solve or whatever. They need to live it. They need to practice it. And then during this time, we're doing our most important work, which is responsive teaching, right? So um, even though I know days are full and it can honestly be tempting at times to think, ooh, the kids are all reading. I better catch up on that email or whatever that I had to send back. No, this is not the time we're doing that because this is our most important teaching. The most important teaching doesn't happen in the mini lesson. The mini lesson has a place for here's our through thread. Here's the journey we're all on as inquirers and learners right now. But our most powerful and important teaching happens here. It's our responsive teaching. It's where I can be just in time, just for this student, one-on-one -on -one and one-on-one -on -one conferences or perhaps pulling little communities to practice together. These three students have a common need. These four students have a common need. Rather than doing four different one-on-one -on -one conferences, we're gonna come together as a small group and dive into that need together. So that's really the heart of workshop. And then we would come back together at the end for a few minutes of share time. This is usually about five minutes. Um, sometimes it's sharing with a table group. Sometimes it's sharing with a partner. Sometimes it's coming back together as a whole class, but it's really about goal setting, celebration, reflection, right? This kind of ensures that we don't neglect that reflection aspect of the inquiry interplay. Reflective practice is so powerful. So here's the practice and there'd, there'd be reflection happening in the midst of things too. And do we ensure there's time to regularly reflect, goal set, collaborate, come back and share and lift, lift up uh, our community once again too. But at its heart, this is what workshop is about. Because when we have many different students with so many different needs, um, it's, it's a big calling for us as teachers. So how can we help frame our minutes in ways that makes this possible, that makes it possible to be just in time for learners, that makes it possible to really on the regular let kids live out this inquiry interplay throughout uh, the workshop framework and structure. And going back to where we started, the teaching does have a place, but it's within that vein of agency and empowerment. 
As it says here in an inquiry classroom, explicit teaching occurs just in time, not just in case, right? And this is at the heart of our beliefs in the IB. This is also at the heart of workshop. This is what workshop is all about too. I wanna be just in time, not just in case. So I'm not gonna give a 27 minute whole group lesson. I know there's no way that's just in time for every student, right? Sometimes I even have to, when I'm still working with schools and doing some demo teaching in their classrooms, I still keep in my mind, kind of as a mantra, like just in time, not just in case, Tanya, because you'll be in this mini lesson and you'll think, oh, I better say one more thing, like just in case, <laughs> oh, just in case, just in case, no. I need to cut myself off. We had one clear idea that was shared here that they're gonna add to their toolbox, to their repertoire. Now let's go off and live it. And then I can see just in time, not just in case, who's ready to go even further, who needs more support. And I can make that happen just in time, just for them, one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, right? This framework allows me to really live out this value of, of doing explicit teaching in an inquiry classroom right, just in time, not just in case. So those are a few ideas to get us started with this. Um, I'd love for you to stay in touch if it leads to even more questions than what we could ask. We're gonna have a few minutes for questions now, but here are some ways you can stay in touch too. I'm kind of on every type of social media, so just look me up and reach out, or you can always email me if you have specific questions too. Um, and then definitely, definitely one big way to stay in touch is through EduSpark. So we just kind of saw a little tip of the iceberg of some ways that workshop and the IB and an inquiry-based approach can work together. But if you'd like to dive in deeper, there's a course called Stronger Together Workshop in the PYP via EduSpark. And in that course, we'll dive deeper into how you might plan many lessons that, that do have clarity and brevity in mind, that also lift up profile attributes and ATL. Um, how might we kind of live out this framework on the daily with students in a way that also honors our IB values. Um, it is uh, catered towards the PYP, but if you're MYP educators out there, um, I think you could also uh, really gain a lot from the course because a lot of it is focusing on those bigger pieces of ATL and profile attributes. So that applies to all of us. And definitely if you teach different disciplines, it's um, not just for reading and writing, it's for all disciplines. So if some of these things sparked your interest that's a place to go. And then I'd love to just open the floor if we have any wonderings or questions uh, for the next few minutes. Hi, Tonya, it's Michelle here. I'm going to um, ask um, some members of our audience, I think we might have some questions from our audience here. Um, but firstly, thanks very much for sharing that with us. And, uh, and I can't help but think um, as an MYP educator, there's, there is lots to learn here, so I'm sure the people are going to jump into your course and, and perhaps learn a little bit more about that framework that, and, and how that will work for their classes, the provocations that happen in those mini lessons. Yes, yeah, no, I hope so. And for sure, you know, any of you who do jump in and add to Spark, uh, I truly mean it, um, reach out anytime. So as you're taking it as well, you know, shoot me an email, let me know what you're thinking, uh, all that kind of stuff. I'd love to hear about it, yeah. And then, yeah, if there are any questions, let's lift those up. Okay, open to the floor. Have we got some questions from anybody here? Yes, yep. well, we've got we one. Beth. Here's, here's, here's the microphone's traveling around, Tonya. So we'll just get the microphone and we'll be right there. Thank you, Mr. Crackle. Hi, Tanya. Hello. Hi, Tanya. It's Beth. Um, I am wondering, because we've implemented Readers and Writers Workshop, this is our second year, and so one of the greatest challenges we find, I think we all buy into the philosophy of the purpose and how it allows for personalized learning, time. <laughs> you know, the workshop process takes time, so what are your hot tips on how to integrate, you know, units of inquiry while using the workshop model as well? Yeah, I know time Time is, you know, I mentioned at the start, uh, every school is different and, and it's true, but I tell you no matter what school I'm working with, time is always the question. It's an important one, right? Because again, we, we never quite have enough of it. So I think a few different things to think about when it comes to time. Um, you mentioned integrating it in with like your unit of inquiry, for example. One thing to think about there that's, that's often really helpful is um, 
in, in the PYP, we would know there are really three types of units. Um, there's your transdisciplinary unit of inquiry. There's also a time and place for subject-specific inquiries. And then there's what the PYP would refer to as preparing for or following from. Um, that's a little worry, so I often call it staggered timing. But this idea of really being intentional with our timing can help because what it means is if, um, you might think about instead of starting everything at the same time when you're bringing things together in a transdisciplinary way, you might want to think about students' uh, surface knowledge, deep knowledge, transfer knowledge. We're all about the transfer, both in the IB and in a workshop approach. Um, and the truth is you, you can't connect the dots if there are no dots. So sometimes you need to lay dots. Sometimes there's a time and place to maybe do a, a bend or like a week or a week and a half, two weeks even, of let's say it's, it's writing you're thinking about. We might do a bend where students are doing some information writing, um, but rather than them first <laughs> jumping in and, and writing about um, whatever, maybe you're talking about issues with uh, ecosystems <laughs> when, you're, when you're studying, exploring in your UOI, instead of writing about a certain ecosystem, could they do some information writing and teach you about any topic they're passionate about? So this opens up space for agency as well. Maybe that's happening during some of your time that you have for some writing, but during your quote unquote UOI time that you have available, you're doing provocations into ecosystems. You're being immersed in, in exploring and inquiring into these different ecosystems. And what are the issues in our current um, state? What are issues of the past, present, future, you know, depending on the context? They're doing this inquiring and this researching. Um, but in writer's workshop, they're currently writing about any topic while they learn the skill of information writers. So that then in your next bend of the unit, if we think of units as a journey with bends in the road, perhaps in the next bend, then you're able to say, you know, all those skills we've learned as information writers, how could we apply that to the work we've been doing um, in, in our unit of inquiry? Like how could we teach others about what we're learning? And then they're able to take those skills and connect the dots and transfer. And then, then you're using both writer's workshop time and unit of inquiry time, if you want to think about it that way, um, for all things transdisciplinary. But you started with laying some groundwork, laying some dots to connect the dots. So that's one way that time's often, often used. Um, and then another way, because <laughs> there's never one way, um, is to really ensure that your central idea is conceptual. A lot of times we're not able to bring things together because we're actually still working within like a topic-based unit rather than a conceptual unit. Um, a, a quick example from a group I was working with last year um, that I often lift up is that they had a unit that was about weather um, at the time, which is of course a topic. So we worked together to talk about, well, is it really about weather? Like what's it really about? And when thinking about what they really wanted students to understand, it was about patterns, it was about theories. So instead of people make predictions about weather patterns, it was uh, people make predictions and form theories based on patterns. Um, and weather was still a case study, right? But they were also able to explore this same idea in readers workshop with book clubs because you also form theories and make predictions about characters. Right. So um, rather than only doing information reading at that time about weather, the unit wasn't about weather. It was about patterns and predictions. And we had weather and natural hazard case studies. We were looking at math patterns and how we study math patterns to make theories and predictions. And that really hits on that goal of transdisciplinarity, which is going between, across and beyond the disciplines. Right. Between, across and beyond. So it's about this larger concept. So sometimes that helps too. And then the last thing I'll say, I know uh, we're short on time, but one other, to think about, one other thing to think about is that workshop is flexible. So there might be certain days where your mini lesson happens in the middle or you start with share time and then have a long work period and no mini lesson that day. Um, you might have certain days that are what we call repertoire days where it's like a micro lesson and you like remind them of the things you've talked about Monday through Thursday to then on Friday kind of have a repertoire day where it's really just all work periods. So if that's our issue with time too, if it's that we have smaller periods, like I only have 40 minutes to do a workshop, 
you might think about how you use mini lesson work period share time. What we saw today was kind of a classic model, but you can be flexible based on your students' needs with how those pieces are, are moved around and maybe thinking across your week rather than across your day. Um, because uh, because it, what matters is our context. And we as teachers have to be those intentional decision makers too. So just knowing there's some flexibility there with that model as well. As long as that heart stays in place. The biggest thing is time for kids to live it and us to responsibly teach. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, uh, thank you so much for your time, uh, Tonya. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Tonya Gilchrist. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thank now we're on to the final speaker for this session. Uh, the late Sir Ken Robinson once described our final speaker as the practical embodiment of high thinking on unleashing creativity and potential. A former globally renowned and life-changing school principal, he's taken innovation by storm. Richard has been named UK Business Speaker of the Year three times, and his time now sees him working with organisations at the forefront of global innovation and excellence, including Microsoft, Deloitte and Google, just to name a few. It's our privilege to welcome to D22 here at Dwight School Seoul, Richard Jerva, and uh, please make him welcome. Thank you, Richard. Good afternoon, everybody. What an incredible, uh, well, thank you, first of all, for the introduction. My mum would be um, so proud of that. Um, thank you for hanging around and waiting to um, hear from me at the end of the day. I've seen so far the incredible inputs from the various uh, speakers and uh, people involved in this conference, and it, it looks absolutely stunning. Um, the incredible bank of knowledge and experience and skills and development. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the tone down for the last 15 minutes and just share some random big thoughts with you to hopefully send you away uh, to think deeply about everything you've heard over the last day or so. Um, but I want to start on a very personal footing because I want to spend a few minutes just thinking about the lived experience of the last two years and what that means to us as educators moving forwards. You know, what we've all lived through, what we continue to live through in different parts of the world is truly extraordinary. And of course, not only with a global pandemic, pandemic but the horrific events that we're seeing in Ukraine as well. And I just want to share a few emotional responses to the kind of world that we've been living through over the last two years, and specifically, around the events of COVID. You know, I, I wonder how many of you can relate to this, that over the last couple of years, and specifically early on in the pandemic, January, February, March, 2020, when we all started to realize the gravity of what we were dealing with on a global scale, how many of these emotional responses and reflexes are things that are familiar to you? And uh, periods of time where I don't know about you, but I've gone through um, long phases of an emotional paralysis, a, a, a mental paralysis, where no matter what I tried to absorb, nothing went in. You know, I would be reading uh, books or news reports or watching television news, trying to absorb some of the gravity of what we were dealing with. And there would be moments where, despite concentrating and focusing on these things, nothing would go in. Nothing was happening. Um, that kind of, men, you know, the sort of thing, the mental paralysis you feel when you're reading a book and for 20 minutes you know you're actually reading the words, but you kind of sit up from that and you think, actually, I remember nothing. And then after that kind of mental paralysis, times of denial. Oh, it won't be that bad. Oh, it won't be that serious. You know, with the pandemic, oh, it'll be over by Easter. Or with the events that are happening in Ukraine, it won't escalate. Those emotions we try to use to rationalize, to make ourselves feel better, desperately trying to grapple and hold on to levers to gain some semblance of control over our lives. And then also during those phases, moments of intense anger. I don't know how many of you have 
experienced or seen a rise in kind of amplified anger over the last couple of years. As people look for something to blame for the situation they're in. And then also, and I've been through this many times in the last couple of years, phases of despair, of absence of hope, of a feeling that actually, no matter what I do, stuff is beyond my control. Now, the reason I share that with you at the start of this session is this. As educators, what I've just described to you is not just the emotional states we've lived through during COVID, but they are the emotional reflexes and responses on a human level to how many of us experience change when it's being done to us. It's the reflex and response when we no longer feel that we are active participants in a process, but that we're victims to it. And in many ways, education can feel like that on every level. For us as educators, the endless top-down stuff, the new initiatives, the new policies, the new structures, the new must-dos. For some of our children in the wrong kind of classrooms, learning can feel hugely disenfranchising. It can feel like it's stuff that's being done to us, that the levers of control are being wrenched from us. And it's why, if you think about it, we see these responses not just as a result of COVID, but in our classrooms and in our schools every day. Mental paralysis, denial, anger, despair. And the good news is, again, as I reflect on the lived experience of the last two years, some of the answer, a large proportion of the answer to how we re-engage, re-empower our colleagues, ourselves, our students, lies in curiosity. The ability to take an interest, to question. It's extraordinary. The minute we're able to ask open questions, the minute we're able to take control of some of that process, we start to feel ourselves gain more control over our lives again. Curiosity is everything. And we need to be so careful in the complex world we live in, not just in the global sense, but in the education sense, that we don't just wait for other people to provide the answers to questions we didn't ask. But actually, as you reflect on the experience you've had over the last day or so, it's not about saying, oh, I don't feel as good a teacher as I should do because I should have been doing that or I need to be doing this. It's actually now from the experience you've had over the, this conference is taking a step back, taking a breath and going, OK, now what more do I want to know on my terms about what I've learned in the last day or so? Let me introduce you to uh, a remarkable man. Now, some people have said he looks a little bit like my grandfather. And I wish, frankly, this is Barry Barish. Barry Barish was the 2017 Nobel Prize winner for physics, an extraordinary human being. He's considered to be right up there as one of the most significant minds in science in history. And a year or so before the pandemic, I suppose of late 2018, I got the chance to interview him. And I asked him a couple of questions and I'd like to share his responses with you because I think they're deeply relevant to us. I often get the chance to interview people from outside the education sector and I find what they have to say fascinating. And I often ask them about what kind of people they try to gather around them, the people they try to employ, the people they try to work with. Because in many ways, the people they're looking for are our students as they come through the education system. So I said to him, how did you go about building a team, a research team that went on to win a Nobel Prize? He said, I'll tell you. He said, we advertise in all the usual scientific journals. I said, how many applicants did you get? He said, oh, serious applicants. We had just over three and a half thousand. 
I said to him, can you qualify that for me? What do you mean by serious applicants? He said, oh, Richard, the serious applicants were the ones who had at least two doctorates to their name. Two, two doctorates. I don't know how many of you have attempted one, but two? He said, these were people who already had significant reputations in the world of science, whose abstracts had been published in some of the most important journals in the world. He said, so we had over three and a half thousand. I said, and how many funded places did you have on your research team? He said, 138. It was an incredibly well-funded research program. I said, how on earth did you get from three and a half thousand to 138? He said, two caveats. He said, because it was clear on paper these people had everything we needed. He said, the first was this. He said, there's a lot of misunderstanding about research, particularly about scientific research. He said, too many people make the mistake in research and academia of believing that research is about finding ways to prove what you already think or what you already know or what you already do. I have to be honest, I think to an extent we've suffered a little bit from that in education over the last few years. And then he said something which I think is one of the most poetic and beautiful and challenging things I've ever heard anyone say. He said, when you're looking for people to engage in meaningful research, you need to find people who have the courage to challenge the beauty of the proof. Isn't that beautiful? We could probably spend an entire day reflecting on that. People who have the courage to challenge the beauty of the proof. And maybe actually that's what we should be aspiring for, for our young people, our students, our children in our schools. He said, and in order to do that, you can't have one dimensional people. He said the problem with the field of science is as people grow into their careers, as people become increasingly successful, they become more and more blinkered about doing one thing in one way. They hang out with people who do what they do. So people start breathing increasingly rarefied air. And actually, it means that innovation and thinking differently and challenge becomes more and more difficult. He said, so nobody made it onto my team if they weren't three-dimensional. And by that, he meant people that didn't just have science on their CVs. He said, those people were no good to me. He said, I needed people with recent experience and a love of the arts, of humanities, of a holistic range of things. He said, when we were looking at people's uh, CVs, we were looking for interesting people with interesting hobbies, with interesting things to tell us about stuff we wouldn't know about. And he said, the second caveat, was nobody made it onto our team if they didn't have the ability to ask stupid questions. Isn't that lovely? Now, again, we could talk about that all day. Is there such a thing? What do we do to create climates where we, our colleagues, our children, our communities, feel totally relaxed and comfortable asking stupid questions because of course the one hard truth we know about learning is learning's tough it has to be because of course you learn nothing new when you get something right you only ever learn something new at the point of a mistake or the realization you don't know something or you can't do something so we have to create a climate where people aren't rewarded when they get things right but when they actually have the courage to ask stupid questions and to challenge the beauty of the proof. A couple more thoughts for you, and then I promise I'll let you go. The first is this. I want you to imagine the next time you go into your classroom, that you're actually a croupier walking into a casino, and the children, the students coming into your class are gamblers, and they're going to gamble some of their self-esteem, self-confidence, resilience with you in order to learn something new. Now, some of those students will come in with hundreds of poker chips. They're the high rollers. You know the kids. The ones that have got their hands up before you've finished asking a question. The ones that know everything. They're chucking poker chips on the table as you roll the ball and spin the wheel. They're putting chips on red or black or odd or even, or even an individual number because they've got loads of them left. And then you've got other students walking into your casino with one poker chip of self-esteem. 
And those kids are looking at the game thinking, I'd love to play, but I've only got one poker chip. And if I put it on red or I put it on black and it comes up on the other, if I put it on odd and it comes up even, I've got nothing left. So I'll just stand in the corner and try and be invisible. Now the thing about change, which for me is synonymous with learning, is you cannot engage in those processes if you don't have enough poker chips to play the game. So fundamentally, again, I ask you as you leave this incredible day to reflect on how many poker chips you have, how many poker chips your colleagues have, and most importantly, how many poker chips your students have. Because the truth is we can have every technical approach to teaching and learning we want. But if the people walking into our classrooms don't have enough poker chips to play the game, no matter how exciting it may appear, they're just not gonna wanna play. And let me finish this very quick, random selection of thoughts with you with a final big moment mic drop for you. Just before the pandemic, I got to meet one of those people on my fantasy dinner party list. You know those lists we make up of the people we'd love to meet if we had the chance. And just before the pandemic, I got to meet the number one person on my list. I got to spend an hour or so with him. Now, a couple of things to say about that picture. The first is, obviously I was on his fantasy dinner party list too, because <laughs> look how happy he is to see me. <laughs> Secondly, it isn't a waxwork, it really is President Obama. And the final thing to say about that picture is, isn't it amazing how many chins a lockdown beard can hide? I'm keeping mine. But I want to finish my session with one final thought for you. Because I got the chance to ask him one question, and the question I asked him was this. What do you think is the most significant thing you learned during your eight years in the White House? And he flashed that smile, and I melted. He said, I'll tell you. He said, when I arrived in the White House, Richard, I was like a kid in a candy store. Because of the position I held, I was able to invite the most brilliant technical minds on earth to work with me, the most brilliant technical uh, political strategists, scientists, economists from every field. He said, but what I realize now when I reflect on those eight years is this, that actually virtually none of the problems that crossed my desk were technical by nature. When you got to their foundations, they were human. They were about love, anger, jealousy, greed, hatred, fear, tribalism. He said, the mistake we too often make in the world is we leap too quickly to find technical solutions when we haven't truly understood the human condition first. And I ask you to think on that too, as you wrap today that actually the answer must lie in the human first before we try and find the right technical elements to support us. And to remember that particularly after the last two years and the continued challenge of this pandemic, it's that human understanding that is truly to make all of the difference. So listen, thank you for your time and attention. I think I might have rolled over by a minute or two. There's an awful lot more from me on the EduSpark platform. So if you've liked what you've heard and for any reason you want to hear more, then please take a look at my courses on there. I think they are now available to all of you. But in the meantime, thank you for your time, attention, for your commitment today and good luck moving forward. Thank you all very much indeed. Bye-bye. Wow. Amazing. Uh, I wish we had a little bit more time to steal from you, Richard. Uh, you might be on, I'd say, a few people's fantasy dinner lists as well in here. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Richard Gerva. Okay, well, that's all the time we have now for our showcase sessions here at D22. We've, uh, we've heard from some really amazing speakers from around the world. Plenty of takeaways for everyone. Uh, remember that you're now about to zoom off to join your Zoom sessions uh, for the job alikes. Um, also, uh, just a reminder, don't forget that the Reflections uh, Zoom session from 4.30pm 
includes our special guest Dan Hasler. Just um, was chatting to him just now on LinkedIn, and uh, he's uh, he's looking forward to that. Well, actually, I didn't ask him about that, so I hope he turns up. Uh, but he'll be there uh, later on this afternoon. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to that. So uh, if you're in one of the job alikes and, and perhaps wanting to jump over there, you can do that, Michelle. Yep. Okay. And uh, before we go, please thank uh, our organising committee, Michelle Newman, <laughs> Richard Todd, Wilbert Crackle, who's been uh, rounding, running around the room. Uh, can we cut to the Zoom upstairs? Can we go upstairs to uh, see? There's some of our team. There's Miss Chloe. And Leo, who's been meeting all of the people. Can we get James, Mr. Hadley? He's in there somewhere. There he is. Give him a round of applause, pressing all the buttons. And uh, how about our camera crew? Can you zoom in on each other? Give each other a wave? <laughs> Big round of applause. They've been bringing the footage to people watching from uh, all around schools around the region. And uh, that's fantastic. And, of course, thank you to Craig and Andrew from EduSpark. We've had a great afternoon so far. More to come in the Zoom sessions this afternoon. Remember to find them via the EduSpark platform. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you here next year at D23. Goodbye.